world. Um, thank you for joining us today on this discussion about how technology can be impactful in children's literacy in developing countries. My name is Deborah Backus, and I'm the project director for the All Children Reading Grand Challenge. Before we start, just a few items of housekeeping. Uh, we'll be keeping everyone muted throughout the conversation, but please don't hesitate to add comments or questions in the chat box. We'll be following those and make sure we raise those at the end of the conversation. We will be recording this today so that it, we can share it with others after the call that weren't able to make it. So just, just letting you know that, that you'll be recorded. If you're using social media, I uh, just wanted to let you know, please tag us at, um, at reading GCD, and we're also at EdTech Transforms hashtag. Um, so let's get started. As I mentioned, I'm Deborah Backus. I'm the project director with World Vision um, on the All Children Reading Grand Challenge for Development. The All Children Reading Grand Challenge for Development is a partnership of World Vision USAID and the Australian government. And together, we run competitions that leverage science and technology to source and disseminate solutions to improve literacy skills of early grade learners in developing countries. One such competition that we ran in 2014 awarded 12 innovators to run two-year technology-based literacy projects. These projects were spread across 10 countries, all piloting different tech solutions to impact literacy. All of the projects focused on providing instruction and materials in mother tongue languages. Some of them were based in the classroom, some were based in communities, and some of them also worked with children with disabilities. We partnered with an organization called School to School International, which is an education research organization that evaluated each of these projects using the early grade reading assessment and also conducted project evaluations and scalability assessments. Today we'll be joined by School to School and three of our innovators that we funded. Uh, Creative Associates that was working in Zambia, Little Thinking Minds that was working in Jordan, and Sesame Workshop uh, which was working in India. So to kick us off, it's my pleasure to introduce Christina Solom, the Senior Director of Literacy and Learning at School to School International, and Amy Reeves, the Technical Manager at School to School International. And I'll turn it over to you, Christina. Thank you so much, Deborah. And it's really a pleasure to finally get to talk about some of these exciting learnings that we had on the project. Um, if we can go to the next slide, whoever's moving them at some point. Okay, thank you. So, School to School, as Deborah said, was tasked with being able to think about what these projects could do in terms of proving, improving literacy. Each of them worked on very different things. Some were doing, you know, some of the early literacy skills, thinking about some of the pre-reading skills. Some were thinking about reading comprehension, oral reading fluency and reading comprehension. So it really was like a wide gamut that we were tasked with with kind of assessing. So what we did is we did an EGRA baseline and end line to look at the student scores, but we also wanted to do a more qualitative robust assessment at the end to try and look at the stakeholders, the context, the technology, and also the implementation of things. But what actually happened in this project, especially because these were pilot projects, um, there were a lot of, there were a lot of uh, lessons learned that were not just about the EGRA learnings, right? These kids definitely demonstrated some of the things that happened on these projects, but not all of them. So can you go back to the research questions still? Sorry. Um, so in our final round with all of the projects, when we completed all of the endline reports, which are lovely and on the All Children Reading, all Children Reading website, um, so we have individual project reports for each project. We also then wanted to kind of come together and say, but what did we learn across all of these very different technology projects in different contexts? So we asked the following three research questions. Were ACR round two projects uh, associated with improvements in children's reading abilities? We are not gonna talk about that now. This is a more complex, nuanced picture. So we definitely want you to look at the report and read um, all the different findings that we had on the projects, but also know that that is a whole different kind of picture than what we're going to talk about. So there were really exciting gains and interesting gains, but we also are going to let you read that uh, section of the report yourself because that could take all the whole hour. Um, we're really going to focus on the second question. What lessons were learned about implementing the project? So thinking about when we went to the countries and talked to the implementers, what did we actually see that worked and what maybe could be improved the next time around? Um, and then finally, in this report that we produced, we have some recommendations for funders. So if, when they're thinking about what would they want to do the next time around, um, in terms of pilot projects, in terms of using technology for literacy, what should they maybe be thinking about that might be able to 
to jump over some of the things that we saw that were challenges for some of the grantees on this in this round. Um, so we have five lessons that I want to share with you, um, and then my colleague is going to talk a little bit about some of the scalability pieces that we learned. So the first the one that we found is technology-based projects really do have the potential to provide new um, learning materials to underserved populations. So one of the things that these projects did is lots of, lots of the students that they were working with didn't have mother tongue reading materials at their fingertips. So these projects were able to um, provide those materials by bringing technology closer to the student. So maybe in a, in a language that they wouldn't normally be disseminated in, so publishers aren't printing in, they aren't able to produce in, they are providing these technology, through technology they're providing the liter literacy materials. So these students are really having access to materials that they never had before. And that is something that I think technology, we found across meeting with the USAID missions, um, other stakeholders in the countries, they said this is really the only way that a lot of mother tongue materials will be getting to these students. Um, is there something I need to do about the shared screen window? I don't control the PowerPoint, so I'm not sure. Deborah, is there something I should be doing? I will try to fix it. Okay, I'll just keep going. <laughs> I'll just keep talking and hopefully it'll work. Um, so, these projects really were able to provide mother tongue materials to students that didn't have that. And I think that stakeholders were saying that this needs to continue to be leveraged because there isn't a way for other, other um, entry points into these, these populations to be able to provide that. So that was really exciting. And we saw that across almost all of the projects, including using Braille in the Philippines, um, and using in Cambodia, they were able to provide 24 ebooks at, at levels that the students had never had print books of the same kind for. So then the next, the next lesson, if we can move slides, maybe. The next lesson is that technology-based literacy projects offer individualized learning. This was critical. So a lot of our struggling learners um, in these projects often are the ones that are not able to just get the books and read on um, grade level. And so these projects were all able to differentiate. I think Rama might talk about this a little bit with her project in Jordan. You know, there were five different levels and children could slowly level up. So some students could move through it quicker, some could move through it slower. In Cambodia, as I was mentioning, the same book would have three different levels. So kids at the same time could be accessing different, different levels of difficulty um, while in the same classroom. And this is really revolutionary in terms of providing something that teachers can't in these contexts. You know, they usually have large class sizes and aren't able to provide that individual instruction, small group learning that we hope for. And the technologies were able to provide that in a way that um, allowed these struggling learners to have more repetition and more access in a way that uh, helped them really learn better. And we did see that exposure, increased exposure did help those struggling learners. The third thing that we found is these projects really do um, have the potential to track those experiences as well. As we know, you know, when we use our smartphones, everybody knows what we've been accessing. You know, we see the ads later because they know what, what websites we go to. The same is true for these learning um, apps. You know, all the content that they access and how long they access the content. And if they did the quizzes, can be tracked. We do have that technology, but it proved really difficult for many of the projects to actually get that up and running and ready in time. Because they were also building the, the content, the books, you know, all the different pieces of these projects and they were short. But we really think that this would contribute to the next kind of phase of this learning because this would really leverage that individualized learning. If we could say that, Sash read three books, but then never was really able to get the quizzes, and we understood which errors she was getting on the quizzes. We would understand what Sash might need the next time around, and, and we could actually build that in. And, and the grantees mostly wanted to do that, but just weren't actually able to actualize that. There were software updates. There were you know, challenges in terms of the amount of data that could be stored on the different platforms that they use. So it didn't happen very well in most of the projects, um, but it was definitely something that they were starting to do and you could see that it would have been very beneficial to this individual learning piece that we hope um, can happen the next time around. So we think that it's important to consider what um, that kind of tracking can do and how that could be built in. And I think that really means that we have to have a lot more time for testing because it doesn't, um, 
it doesn't happen overnight. It does take a lot of work to figure out unique IDs, especially when you're not accessing the internet every time you're logging on, if they're going offline to do some of this and then maybe logging in later. So it's really something that we saw them struggle with, but also with like a real potential in the future. Um, the fourth one is that the quality of the hardware and the software, this maybe seems basic, but it's a really critical piece. The quality of that software and hardware is really critical to the, um, to the delivery of this content. So you could have great literacy content, but if the software is not easy for the children to maneuver through, if it doesn't actually, if it's not intuitive enough for the adults to help troubleshoot when the kids don't know what to do, then the software doesn't get used as well and gets put on the shelf. The other thing is the hardware was really challenging for some projects. Some projects were hoping to use the, soft, the hardware that families already had, maybe a smartphone that they already owned, or desktop computers in a school in the case of Jordan. And then when the project showed up, those, those hardware um, specifications weren't up to par for the software that they needed to actually use. And so there was a mismatch. So then they had to provide the hardware and the software and then try and get that all right at the same time. So really trying to figure out which leapfrog you're trying to do, is it the hardware moving forward, is it the software, is it both at the same time and how you test that and then get that ready. I think maybe some of our grantees today will talk about, but that was definitely a learning that we saw in many of the projects that both of those pieces had to come together. Um, and some projects kind of really excelled at getting good literacy content and struggle with software. Some were other, were more sort of software heavy, um, had those backgrounds. So they did a really good job of building the software, but the content maybe wasn't as strong and as useful as what they might need. So I think it's just really trying to figure out how to get that balanced. Um, and we saw that the ones that did, that was really helpful, but most, most really struggled with one or the other at some point during their project and had to work on that. And then I think the fifth big lesson that we saw through all of these projects is that um, there needs to be more time considered for the, the building of ICT skills, especially for adults. This is not, this is probably not surprising, but the students tended to, you know, access and jump in the technology, use it, play with it, figure it out. The teachers, the parents, whoever were the caregivers that might be supporting those students using it, often struggled more with the technology, couldn't use it, and couldn't troubleshoot as much. Um, and so projects use different things. I know in the case of Jordan, they used um, ICT interns the first year. I know for Sesame, they had people go out and do troubleshooting in the villages to make sure the cell phones were working and apps weren't getting deleted. But you really did have to think about that piece. And, and it wasn't for the kids. The kids, you know, once they start using it, they're using it. It's everybody else around the kids that you need to kind of think about their ICT skills and whether they can support the learning that um, you want these kids to be having when they use the technology. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Amy, who's gonna talk about some of the lessons that we learned when we did our scalability assessment on these projects. Thanks, Christina. Um, so part of uh, STS's work on the ACR projects was to conduct a scalability assessment for each project. And by scale up, we mean to expand, replicate, adapt, and sustain a successful intervention in a new geographic area over time or um, to reach more beneficiaries over time. And uh, when we designed our tool, we took, next slide please, uh, we designed um, our tool or our um, our tool for assessing scalability, uh, we adapted it from an existing tool by MSI. Uh, and this tool had seven parameters upon which it assessed scalability. There are credibility, observability, relevance, relative advantage, ease of transfer and adoption, testability, and cost. And we took a, not a prescriptive approach, but we took a descriptive approach. We didn't want to say this project should, yes, be scaled or this project should not be scaled, but we wanted to give the stakeholders and decision makers uh, end up evidence that they could use then to make decisions about whether a project should be scaled up. And to populate our assessments, uh, we used a number of different qualitative and quantitative data sources. We used key informant interviews, uh, focus group discussions, EGRA results, literature reviews, project uh, monitoring and evaluation data, as well as project cost data. And when we uh, populated the uh, scalability assessments in each project's end of project evaluation report, we presented a summary of the evidence 
from each of those data sources under all of the seven parameters that I mentioned before. And then we provided a descriptive conclusion underneath each parameter about the feasibility of scale up. Again, these were descriptive conclusions. Um, they weren't, yes, uh, project should be scaled or no, it shouldn't. And then we came to the summative report, which is the report that we're, that Christy and I have been discussing today. Uh, we took all of those descriptive conclusions from all of the projects and we codified the conclusions into three different categories. Scaling is easier, scaling is somewhat easy, more information is needed, or scaling is harder. And we did this so we could identify trends across the projects underneath each of these seven parameters. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of these trends. Um, and then I would encourage you all, as Christina mentioned, to reference the end of project reports, um, not only to see the scalability assessment results for each of the projects, but also to see all the robust EGRA findings. Um, so credibility, by credibility we mean do stakeholders believe the model has a strong evidence base? And under this parameter, we found that implementers that utilized existing evidence or theoretical knowledge about the efficacy of a specific component, literacy approach, or technology had higher credibility for scale. In other words, projects appeared easier to scale if they designed their model by building on an existing evidence base, both in terms of the literacy intervention that they choose, as well as the technology. And the next parameter is uh, observability. And by this we mean, uh, is there proof that the project shows efficacy or impact? And do the stakeholders value the evidence? And we found uh, that positive EGRA results and stakeholder feedback contributed to high ratings of the observability of the interventions. So most of the scalability ratings for the projects under this parameter were scalability is easier or somewhat easy. Uh, for relevance, we mean, is the intervention relevant to the context in which it is being implemented? Does it address a problem that is recognizable and considered important by the stakeholders? And for most projects, we found there was strong evidence that the interventions were relevant and that they addressed uh, a recognizable literacy problem. Uh, so we found that there was really quite a fairly good match between the needs of the population and stakeholder priorities and the interventions delivered by the, by the grantees. And finally, for testability, we mean how easy would it be for potential adopters to test the model if it was piloted in a new context? Um, and we found that as potential adopters would need to invest in update, updating project models, the potential adopters would need to invest significant resources and time to test these projects in these new contexts. Uh, so most projects under this parameter had a rating of scalability somewhat easy or scalability is harder. Um, and so that's all I have for now, but again, I'm going to plug the reports again. Um, they're really robust, they're really complex um, and nuanced, so we encourage you all to, um, to take a look at those and, and, um, and let us know if you have any questions. Thanks so much, Amy and Christina. Um, now I wanted to turn it over to one of the projects so they can talk to how the project was run and um, some of these scalability components. I'll turn it over to Ian Kishore. He's the director of creative of the Creative Development Lab at Creative Associates International, and they had a project in Zambia called Our Way of Stain. So I'll turn it over to you, Ian. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I'm really happy to talk about uh, Makalibwe Atu, which uh, in Chinyanja, which is a language in a local language in Zambia, means our way of staying. Um, and uh, the project was implemented uh, with the, the instructional uh, systems and governance practice area at Creative. Um, and uh, we can jump over to the next slide so we can get into the meat of it. Um, so the model and the, uh, the, the logic uh, as to why we were doing this project was that uh, having worked in Zambia, uh, we have witnessed that there's really no local language materials outside schools or even at schools. As you can see, 58% uh, have no uh, local, like local language materials at home or school. Uh, to begin with, the literacy levels were really low and uh, we were trying to identify assets that we could actually use to bring in uh, uh, content into, uh, into homes. And we found that cell phone penetration is pretty high. So this is basic phone penetration, uh, as you can see, it's 80%. So given these parameters, uh, the, uh, the theory of change that we came up with is that if we are to develop uh, local stories, 
that are culturally relevant and uh, appropriate to the target age of the uh, of the children uh, we are interested in. Uh, and then we uh, distribute this via SMS, uh, which is uh, uh, which is relatively cheap and is a way to actually get to uh, is a way of actually interacting with the basic phone. Um, and we send this to parents, our caregivers, uh, then the parents and caregivers will uh, likely spend uh, it shared with the children and spend time with them uh, reading at home, which will increase uh, uh, reading attitudes and overall uh, create a culture of reading and lead to an improvement in reading outcomes. So with that theory of change, uh, we, uh, we set about actually running an experiment uh, in, uh, um, in Eastern Zambia. So you can look at the next slide in which we uh, uh, basically targeted uh, uh, 1,100 uh, students in grade two and three from uh, 40 different communities in uh, uh, Chipata and Lundazi. And uh, we basically, uh, over a course of actually nine months, uh, exposed them to stories that, that went into them every week. Uh, so form of SMS messages that were another part of the story on Wednesday and then another part on uh, Friday um, and uh, we also on the, on the last day submitted uh, 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 basically a comprehension question um, so that they could uh, or a discussion question so that they can have a conversation um, this along with the sending this via SMS we also had a, a voice line or an IVR interactive voice response so that uh, uh, they could basically call in for free and listen to the story. So the goal of this was to particularly help if uh, the parents were not necessarily illiterate. Uh, you could have actually a voice uh, that accompanied the story as well. Um, apart from uh, Creative, we had some great local partners that we worked with. We worked with a local uh, radio station in the Eastern Province called Breeze FM and also the Tech Hub uh, in uh, Lusaka called Pongo Hive. Can move to the next slide. All right, this is, uh, I don't expect everyone to actually get too much from this. This is a crazy graphic, but I'll try to walk you through the model because we're really excited about the potential, the model and how technology fits in uh, and, uh, uh, you know, can potentially create a culture of reading. So uh, the way we, we uh, the, the first step was basically engaging the community uh, because we wanted to uh, source local stories and uh, crowdsource these stories. And we want to see if technology can help with that. Um, so first of all, we went out uh, uh, creating a radio campaign and posters and uh, uh, encouraging people to send uh, stories. We had different channels. Uh, they could uh, uh, submit it to us over uh, the, you know, the voice uh, IVR line that we had set up. Uh, there was also a website if, uh, you know, people in cities or diaspora wanted to submit stories. And then we also had sneaker net, which is basically, uh, you know, they wrote stories in paper and whenever we had people uh, out there uh, in the school to pick it up or they would actually take the stories and drop it off to our partner uh, radio station. Uh, we, uh, this was actually wildly successful and uh, 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 parents and teachers uh, uh, were the ones who mostly submitted these stories because they realized that it's their stories that actually gets consumed by children. Um, and uh, um, the sneaker net was the most uh, uh, promising, but it was interesting to see still a lot of the submissions coming from SMS, uh, which uh, we actually uh, didn't uh, refund. So people were taking their own paying for SMS themselves to actually submit the stories. So once we received the stories, we basically uh, um, uh, um, we packaged them into, uh, first of all, we made them age appropriate. Uh, we uh, made it appropriate for the, the, the reading levels, and then we packaged it into this SMS format. Um, and this was done by uh, mostly actually volunteer uh, literacy experts. So it was a, a, the model was very engaging. So a lot of public teachers actually awarded their time to uh, to edit these stories. Um, and then finally, this was actually set up, uh, uh, like I mentioned, in uh, segments of SMS. Uh, we have a project in the communities, asked uh, parents to try to spend about 20 minutes per week uh, with their uh, children on this and to uh, we also gave the notebooks to record the stories uh, because uh, uh, if you work a lot with the uh, SMS technology, you realize these basic phones don't necessarily can't keep more than like 10 messages. So you want that uh, we want to provide a mechanism for them to actually uh, still have the content uh, and actually create books that way. So keep moving forward.
I and I think we're losing you a little bit. Yeah. The next slide, for, uh, the next slide actually just gives an example. Subjects. Um, the the reason the project was called Makaliba Ray of Stain uh, was uh, uh, it was basically it was uh, we were trying to source local stories, uh, stories that actually had never seen written form in the local language, uh, and also actually encouraged to have relevant stories. The advantage of a model like this is the content creation is very rapid. Uh, uh, if a you know parents and, and the community members have submitted a story uh, today, within the next, within a few weeks, it could be published and gone out. So it's a great way of rapidly uh, having a relevant, uh, hyper-local relevant content. Um, and, uh, um, and here you can see an example of a story, but uh, uh, the most popular story was actually uh, one of the earlier stories that went out about a, uh, a girl who was uh, really uh, hated going to school. And then uh, uh, turns out that uh, one day a teacher had a conversation with her and, uh, um, and uh, showed her an example of, uh, of a girl who had uh, gone to school and, uh, and, and, and done great things. And uh, so the girl got more interested in going to school and uh, turned out to be a really important person in Zambia. So that was widely popular among kids. And uh, uh, there were different themes we explored similar to that. So we can go to the next page. Um, All right, well, we're pulling up the next page. Uh, this here, basically, I wanted to quickly talk about the, uh, the results. Um, oops, my alarm just went off, so I'll be quick about this. Um, so the, the, uh, there was really high uptake. We were actually pleasantly surprised by the uptake of, uh, of the, the project. Um, almost 100% uh, of uh, parents basically read the, uh, you know, the kids uh, read the story at least once a week. Uh, and 78% of them actually did it three times a week, as we had actually uh, recommended. Um, we uh, uh, almost, uh, I mean, I won't go to the exact numbers, as you can see, all of, uh, nearly everybody used some of the comprehension questions, uh, and uh, the children all found the stories really enjoyable. Um, so I think that was uh, uh, very positive uh, and uh, is, a, is a good indicator that uh, uh, using technology in, in, a, in a package way such as this could actually, uh, you know, create, uh, create an environment in which people are interested in taking on things. I want to quickly talk about the, uh, the results that were conducted from a, a third party evaluator, which was NORC at the University of Chicago. Uh, they mostly tested uh, uh, EGRA and some other uh, um, uh, uptake and attitudes. Uh, and they found that uh, particularly around the uh, three facets of the EGRA, which is uh, non-word reading, um, or reading fluency and reading comprehension. There was uh, uh, literacy gains of, as you can see, effect sizes from 0.2 to 0 0.7, 2, 7, which, uh, effecti which effectively meant that uh, those of the, who were given the treatment were, uh, had double the, uh, the progress in, uh, in, uh, in literacy than those who were in the control group during the same period. Uh, was really promising to us, um, as well as with the, uh, the, uh, the, the, I think the most interesting thing for me was the positive spillover effects. Uh, we found that about, uh, you know, uh, at least 30% more children were actually uh, reached uh, despite who we send, they, you know, they particularly spend time with siblings and neighbors. Uh, uh, what I observed myself and also that uh, the, the you know, uh, project observed was that actually uh, it led to things that we hadn't planned for. So for example, just because of the fact that a father is often father figure, the male figure is, uh, is the holder of the phone in a family, we found that fathers spend more time with their daughters uh, and that raised appreciation for girls schooling. Uh, so that was an interesting uh, thing that we hadn't planned for. Uh, the, uh, uh, we found that this uh, model like this actually could find a great way to mobilize the community to volunteer their time. Um, so we had, uh, you know, mothers and teachers and different community members actually working would try to, uh, you know, try to basically increase uh, um, reading outside the school altogether. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, I think uh, there were also effects that we hadn't uh, really thought of, like the local radio station itself decided to start a, a variety show around these stories, and uh, that, was, uh, that was also very heartening to see. So I'll stop here. There's a lot. I don't think I'm going to get time to talk about scaling. I'm sorry it took a little bit longer. <laughs> no, thanks, Ian. That was, that was a great overview, and I, I think some of the exciting things about this project are is it really engaged families and communities throughout the process, got them excited about uh, the, the 
the stories and reading with their children. And I think this is a good example of using of using the right technology for the context. And um, technology doesn't need to be something that's over sophisticated, but it can be as simple as, as a basic basic feature phone that families are using. Thanks, Rebecca. All right. Now we're going to shift to a project that took place in Jordan. Um, Rama Ka'ali, the managing partner and co-founder of an organization called Little Thinking Minds, um, ran a two-year project in, in schools and mostly Amman, Jordan, and she's going to talk us through this today. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Um, Rama, you're a little quiet. If you could get closer to the mic and maybe speak a little louder, that would be great. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me better now? Okay. A little bit better. <laughs> I'll try to scream. Okay, so um, just to give you some context, Arabic is the fifth most spoken language in the world. And there are over 21 countries um, that have Arabic as their main language. Yet Arabic literacy among children and adults is very low. And various studies have indicated that an Arab child uh, reads approximately 17 minutes a year or the equivalent of one book that is not textbook material. So at Little Thinking Mind, our company, we focus on creating Arabic language digital solutions to improve Arabic learning outcomes. And the company was born out of a deep personal need for my own children. Just, you know, when they were really young, the market was flooded with educational and um, literacy content, video songs, books that addressed English literacy. But for Arabic, um, the, lang the resources were very scarce. And one of the main challenges that Arabic spoken language faces is that 60 to 70 percent of the spoken language is different than the language that is taught at schools, which is the modern standard Arabic or the Fusha Arabic, the formal uh, education language. So whereas children do speak Arabic at home or on the streets, um, Arabic language proficiency is poor when it comes to reading, writing and um, standardized testing. Okay, so if you can move to the next slide. Um, so in public schools, um, 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 in, in public schools, proper school or classroom libraries are virtually non-existent. The books that are in the libraries are mostly all lumped together. They're not leveled or age appropriate. They're in poor condition and scarce. And books in general are very expensive in the region. So with the All Children Reading Grant, with the Grand Child for Development, what we did is we decided to create a leveled classroom library through an application we named Qasas. Um, our, our hypothesis was that if children had regular access to, uh, to books where they could read based on their proficiency and level and not based on their age and where they could read on a regular basis, then their reading scores will improve. So as such, um, and we can, we can move to the next slide. Um, as such, we developed uh, Qisas again, which means stories. And the idea is every child, when they log into the application, they have their own username and password. So it's a, it's a personalized journey. Um, and when they log in, they start from level one. The application was divided into five levels. And when we first started out, we had 50 books. Um, and the children were meant to work their way up from level one to level five. The application is task-based meaning that every child needs to listen to the book. So the books had an audio component. They needed to read them silently and they get a tick at every task they uh, complete. And then they have to answer four reading comprehension questions to make sure they're understanding what they're reading. Um, but they were reading so well that we had to increase the number of books from 50 to 100 and then by the end of the project, 150 books. Um, the, project, the, the product was made to be super cost effective where children end up having a classroom library in the palm of their hand that they could constantly refer to at the cost of buying only one book. Um, and um, okay, so the application of course was delivered on tablets. Um, the first year we implemented this through after school literacy clubs. Um, but that proved challenging for us because some teachers and students were resisting to staying behind after school. So the second year we did it through a regular class uh, during school hours. And the dosage was twice a week for a full academic year. Um, we can move to the next slide. So we implemented this um, uh, project through um, the Jordan Education Initiative, who run ICT-enabled schools. However, our first challenge was that um, the computer labs that we were relying on um, were, very, were in really poor shape. So we needed tablets badly, and we needed them very quickly. 
Um, and so we, we ended up resorting to the private sector. We went to local banks and to a foundation, a local foundation, the Abdel Hamid Foundation and Al Etihad Bank here in Jordan. And they sponsored um, tablets and, and uh, headphones. Um, so we were able to provide around 350 tablets or 300 tablets that were shared between the students. A big lesson learned um, next time is that we need to raise the budget a bit for the tablets. If we had invested in better tablets, um, the experience would have been maybe a bit faster. Um, but and you should have invested in a budget for breakage because we suffered uh, a bit with the tablets breaking and having to fix them and the earphones breaking up and so um, I mean the pro the project ran great and the results were really we're very happy with the results but a lesson learned was that we should have had better um, hardware um, another challenge we faced was internet we uh, again were relying on uh, internet being available in these ICT enabled schools however even though we got sponsorship from a local internet provider to you know to even improve the internet delivery at these schools um, when 30 students logged in at the same time the application became very slow and so we ended up having to uh, switch to an offline program which made life so much easier and so much faster but the downside was that we were unable to collect real-time data as we had planned and again a lesson learned for next time is we'll provide local servers in schools where we uh, download the data weekly um, and another challenge of course was teacher responsiveness especially the teachers in our region are very resistant to technology we had to conduct several teaching tr teacher training sessions and we had to do continuous m and &E. we were very lucky to have had a great m and &E partner here in jordan integrated solutions and their continuous m and &E helped us learn and adapt continuously and we can go to the next slide um, the results were very promising. Um, they showed statistically significant um, improvement, particularly in three areas, uh, syllable identification, reading comprehension, and oral reading fluency. Um, other results include um, very high attendance on the days that the literacy clubs were taking place. We had very endearing stories of various girls uh, braiding their hair differently because they had to put the headphones and they were excited to come to school, but they didn't want to mess up their hair. Um, we had angry moms complain why their children were not selected to be part of the treatment group because they heard such great things about uh, this program from other students and their parents. And they were demanding that we you know, put you know, put their kids there. And teachers, teachers also mentioned much improved self-confidence of students who were more encouraged to stand up and read in front of the uh, classrooms um, uh, and uh, classmates, um, something that we, uh, we were very excited uh, and very happy about. And this was something that they were very resistant to doing is reading out loud and, and speaking in proper Arabic in front of their classmates. And um, that was the next slide, actually, I'm sorry. Um, in terms of um, you know, next, what's, what's next, um, these positive results have led us to have extensive discussions with the Minister of Education here in Jordan, and we even spoke with the minister himself and met with him. We are now working with the ministry with 100 schools, um, including double shift schools that cater to Syrian refugee children who have missed years of schooling. Um, the, the program has great potential for scale up as it is based on modern standard Arabic uh, used in 21 countries. So we are working on also scaling and, and having discussions with other uh, countries to see how we can implement this. But we understand and know that this will take time and it will be um, you know, a, a, a long process and we will keep you updated on what happens with that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Rama. <clears throat> it was good to hear about, about the project and also to hear about um, where the project is going. Um, can you just mention briefly how, how important having research was to moving your project forward and scaling um, from 10 schools or 20 schools to 100 schools? Um, it, 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 it made our voice heard. I mean, we were, we've been doing educational content for the last 10 years but when we had results when we had research you know a research um, that proved that you know this application actually improves EGRA scores it uh, in, immediately we were able to get um, several meetings with the ministry with the minister himself and with even local NGOs here working with Syrian refugees so um, it, it was very having research based um, uh, having a, you know a proven application um, with proper research was essential for us being able to scale up in Jordan. Great, thanks Rama.
So now we're going to shift to a project in India, a little organization. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It's called Sesame <laughs> Workshop. And they did a project in India working with families and communities um, in the state of Maharashtra. And today we're going to turn it over to Sashwati Banjiri. She's going to talk us a little bit through the project. Um, and so I'll turn it over to you, Sash. Thanks, Deborah. Um, and apologies that this is not Elmo presenting. Um, uh, can we just go on to the first slide, please? Thanks. Um, so we, um, this was the second uh, round of the grand challenge that Sesame Workshop won. In the first round, we actually did some work in um, improving reading skills in school settings. Um, but what we really wanted to do was look at home settings and technology um, for India. So our, you know, our entire project was based on the fact that if children were given innovative content um, you know, that could improve their reading and particularly in mother tongue, would we see an overall um, improvement? Um, just to set the context a little bit, in India, 90% of children in grade one, and this is rural data from the all um, the uh, status of um, education report that comes out pretty much every year, 90% of kids in grade one cannot read at grade level. Um, and the other factoid that I want to highlight here is that India has 22 official languages. And a lot of the content that is available here is not really available in regional um, languages and mother tongue, particularly on the digital platform. Um, so what we wanted to do was design something. The project was called Play Connect Learn. Um, it's an interactive app. Um, it's got three packages. Um, each one has stories, poems, games, and a built-in assessment. Um, the idea was that um, all the kids would learn at their own pace and, um, and their own space. Um, ideally, we would have liked the children to use the app for 1.5 hours per week over a nine-month period. And we wanted to, you know, data on use and progress collected. Um, the overarching um, mandates were really that we wanted to um, encourage a culture of reading. We also wanted to um, encourage parents and kids um, to play together, to read together. Um, and we wanted to leverage the television program Gali Gali Sim Sim, which is the Indian adaptation of Sesame Street, which actually we do broadcast in Marathi, which is the local regional language. Um, you know, and kind of provide an umbrella um, for this project. Um, we worked in six districts in Maharashtra, which is on the west of India, and we reached out to 12,000 kids um, from grades one and two. Um, next, please. Thanks. Um, so I'm not going to um, go through this, but you can. You can look at this as a snapshot of what the package looks like. Um, you know, each package had four stories. Um, they had inbuilt games using very simple game engines um, that kids were already familiar with, um, uh, like a memory game or a flow game, uh, which allowed them to um, reinforce and practice their skills, um, you know, with words um, and with um, sentences. And then um, it had an assessment towards the end of um, end of the each uh, package, and the idea was that um, you know, kids required seventy percent correct responses um, to access the next book. Uh, we soon found out that um, kids were not like they would just leave the app if we so um, if they if they did not score seventy percent and they could not unlock the next book. Um, so we changed that a little bit to say that, you know, 70% or three tries. And if after three tries they didn't get it, we unlocked the next book. Uh, we also provided about 28 odd additional story books. Um, and these were, again, in the same local language. Next, please. Um, so this is um, uh, just a snapshot of the process we went through. We did some secondary desktop research. We did a lot of needs assessment.
to finalize locations, design, model. And this really goes back to what Christina was talking about earlier in terms of some of the challenges. Um, you know, I mean, in India is supposed to have the largest um, ownership of uh, mobile phones and high digital connectivity, but actually in rural India, um, sadly, both affordability and accessibility are big issues. Um, we shortlisted uh, potential on-ground partners that would help us reach out to the kids and to the community. Um, and then we just went, uh, went through um, some training, some corrective actions, um, and then disseminating the program. Next, please. Um, so these were some of our challenges um, and, you know, what we had to do in order to kind of come up with solutions. So, like I said, connectivity and accessibility to high-end smartphones were limited in the poorer populations. And one of the challenges as a content development organization who develop technology products always face, and I always say this, do we design for the present or do we design for the future? Um, and the, the smartphones available in India are predominantly Android. Um, a lot of them are Chinese Android smartphones. Each of them work very differently. Um, and when we do test apps, it's impossible for us to test in 500 different versions that's available in the market. Um, and that requires considerable um, resources. Um, so we want what we wanted to do was make sure that the application worked on low-end smartphones and was available offline. Um, so we did that. Um, we also found that children got limited time to engage with the application as um, the phones were mostly owned by fathers who were at work. Uh, we did have to supplement this through on-ground visits um, so that we could educate the parents about the application and how it could help their child. Um, and encourage them to use it together with the children. And we did see a big shift. Uh, we also knew that there was limited internet connectivity and this resulted in mega issues about capturing and syncing data from the app, which would have triangulated or provided another set of data along with what STS captured on a much larger population. Um, we did provide SD cards to the facilitators and we trained them for data syncing um, to resolve app-related concerns of the users. Um, so we did provide some of the solutions, but um, at the end of the day, um, I think uh, we need to do a lot more work on the app itself to make sure that it's optimized for use. Next, please. I think that's the end, right? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so um, STS did the evaluation and we saw that the app actually had, you know, we had significant improvements in four out of the six EGRA outcomes that were tested. Um, additionally, we also found that 64% parents reported that their children use the app once every day and 84% children had accessed and read the additional PDF books in the app. And this has been very, very encouraging um, to us because we are also hearing back from our partners and from the community about the ripple effect this has had um, within um, the overall community. Schools apparently have bought projectors um, and so that they can get this app available to all the children in the classroom. So even though it wasn't designed as a classroom application, um, in the future when we are really looking at uh, revising the app, one of the things we are looking at doing is actually having an HTML5 version, um, you know, as more and more schools get digitized in India, um, we are hoping that this app would find um, a space within that um, just to uh, look at scalability. Next, please. I think that was your last slide, Sash. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, I know we had a film, but we, uh, we'll just send that to everybody, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Sash. That that was uh, that was great, and we'll be sharing in the chat box a film that shows their project, how it worked, and really emphasizes the individualized learning approach um, that was allowed through through using the phone phone technology versus uh, just just having hard copy books. Um, I know we have a lot of questions, um, so just wanted to 
encourage everyone send your chat questions through the chat um, and then um, I'll turn it over to my colleague Michelle who's going to highlight some of the questions that we have in the chat. Yeah, I know um, a few of you had, we had some audio issues with Ian's presentation, so I just wanted to clarify some of the things that he said earlier. I know there was a question about the intervals of the stories being sent out, um, and we answered some of that in the chat, but for those of you who didn't see it, just to clarify, the stories were broken into three segments and sent three times a week. One segment on Monday, the next segment on Wednesday, and the final segment on Friday, and there were 140 characters per segment, as you would with SMS. And also a local literacy expert took the submitted stories and adapted them from, for SMS to ensure proper story structure and leveling. And the treatment was for nine months. I'd, Ian, I don't know if you have more to add to that, but um, if you could also answer the question if there were any issues you had with special characters that might have been used in the stories um, through SMS transmission. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize I actually disconnected, so I don't know how much you missed, but uh, it's only appropriate that we disconnected from Washington, D.C. and not Jordan or India. But anyways, um, <clears throat> so in terms of special characters, we didn't uh, necessarily have uh, issues, I believe, and I can go back and check because, uh, uh, you know, the Chinyanja script is uh, mostly is based on Latin, mostly in uh, the Chichewa script. Um, so when, at least all the stories that I looked at, uh, uh, you know, they, they didn't necessarily have that issue. But honestly, the phones, the uh, uh, basic phones can uh, have different language packages um, and uh, they can support more scripts. So I don't, uh, again, I can look into that a little bit more. Um, and as for the, uh, the you know, the, the model, uh, again, I don't know how much you missed. So I'm sorry about that. But uh, yeah, really, it, was, it, was, it was set up as a, uh, as a way to basically provide, uh, uh, use the SMS uh, construct, which is limited, limited to 140 characters and break up the story so that there's engagement during the week. You know, you put the leave a story at a cliffhanger and let it continue. Um, and, uh, um, and then, you know, uh, you basically have in parallel um, audio with that as well as uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the discussion questions. So we did that, uh, we, uh, we had a dosage of about nine, uh, nine months in which we did that uh, um, every week. Okay, thank you. Um, also, Rama from Little Thinking Minds, the question, could your app be used with other languages that use Arabic script? Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's not, um, the application can be used in any language. The challenge will be finding the leveled books. So, Rama, just to clarify, many of the books that you have were sourced from Arabic publishers. Um, so they weren't books that were created by Little Thinking Minds, but were curated and put on the platform. Exactly. And then the words light up. So and so then, then they were recorded by local um, by lo local voice recording people. And so and then when the and for the audio part, when the books were read out loud, um, the, the words highlight on the screen. So, and they were highlighted word by word, not letter by letter. And this can, the technology is there. So it's not, um, it can be done in any language. But again, I, I feel the challenge is finding um, the, the level appropriate books for the language we want to tackle. Great, thanks and Rama. One other question for you, Rama. Um, have any of your Arabic apps from Little Thinking Minds been tested with Syrian refugee children? And are the apps available for download by the public? If you could just respond to that. Um, so right now we're working in uh, 100 government schools, which is based on what we worked with Kisas, but we modified some books. So we're tackling more um, life skills, um, social, toler um, social cohesion, tolerance, and different themes. So we, we just changed the books around because they wanted to focus on certain um, uh, themes. Uh, and so, um, and because of the challenge of the internet, these are, the app is available only offline. But we can make it available in other contexts. Um, you know, if there are other uh, refugee contexts where they need the application, we can make it available. It's just not on the app store because it's not an online solution. Um, and then a question for for any of the presenters um, today, um, of course, on the issue of sustainability, which is of interest for all these projects. Um, Technology-based projects often face challenges in implementation, as you have listed, um, but those are usually addressed. But when a project is over, 
um, it's hard for governments to continue with these projects. Do you have any feedback or advice or lessons learned about sustainability, especially without continued uh, donor funding? Uh, maybe I can I can uh, quickly go on that. So I mean, we did uh, uh, you know I think through the project we built the capacity of the the project to be run locally, um, and uh, uh, we identified that a lot of this can be volunteer based. In terms of continuing the project, um, you know I think uh, there are different approaches one could use, and we've been, uh, for example, trying to discuss with private partners if they could subsidize the cost of this to continue. Um, so, for example, particularly since the project is SMS based with a, you know, with a mobile uh, uh, operator, uh, take this on as a way of uh, potentially reducing uh, churn of their clients by providing them a value added service uh, via these uh, messages. So that could be one, uh, one opportunity. Um, so, uh, you know, that's uh, at least our, uh, you know, a little bit on our approach is that, uh, you know, to begin with, we picked uh, uh, picked a technology that was uh, low cost, and then the uh, the assessment also had uh, uh, parameters on uh, how much this would uh, cost to scale up. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think it's an, it's valuable for every project to to also go through an exercise of trying to shave off uh, from the learnings uh, what the cost would be and what the core of the the offering is to see really what the uh, you know what it uh, costs uh, to get it uh, get it out to scale. So I'll stop, but I just want to share some of the things that we're thinking about. Thanks, and um, and Deborah, if I if I could talk a little bit because I'm also getting a few questions on the chat box here. Um, so how are we looking to scale it up? I think the first thing we are doing is looking at seeking some funding so that we can improve the app. We need to optimize the app for easier download, um, you know, and we also do want to make a version of it that would work on desktops. Um, so there are two or three things we are looking at for scale and sustainability. One is that the government of India has actually um, started digitizing a lot of primary schools and particularly in Maharashtra, the state we worked in, there are, um, you know, 15,000 primary schools have already um, been digitized um, and they have also started an e-portal. So the idea is that if we have a web version um, of the app, then to make it available, so that these schools can download. So that's an easy entry point. Um, the second way we are looking at is to encourage discoverability and downloading. Um, and this we would like to do um, via our television program. We have um, close to 2.2 million kids who actually see our Bharati program on a daily basis in Maharashtra. And we wanted to tag a slate at the end of it encouraging kids to download this app or encouraging parents to download their app for the kids, um, as well as doing some very targeted um, online YouTube type of and Google ad type of activities, um, getting um, people to kind of download it. Um, we haven't done any of this, but this is something that we would like to do in the future. Um, great. Thanks, I just wanted to, I know we're close on time, but I wanted to pose one more question to STS as we, as we wrap up. Christina, Amy, I just wanted to ask how you chose this specific scalability assessment and how you would recommend to others to use with this when um, implementing technology-based uh, literacy projects or reading projects or education projects, anything that, that might be leveraging technology in that way. Amy, do you want to tackle that or you want me to jump in? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll start and you can add on. Um, so when we were um, tasked with conducting a scalability assessment, we tried to do a bit of ground research to find out what available tools there were. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel and create something from scratch. Um, so we found a tool that existed and then we modified it to be able to, um, like I said, uh, be able to provide descriptive information for the stakeholders and for um, for the project so they can learn more about what are the parameters upon which they should think about scale. Um, I, in terms of suggesting um, for the future, I, I mean, I think that there's probably a wide range of other existing tools that might serve the purpose. I think it just depends on what, uh, what specifically the aims of the scalability assessment are. Um, Christina, I don't know if you have anything to add. 
No, I mean, I think just one of the important things is that people should be doing this. Even after a one year or two year project, people should be looking at what this did in the different realms and what is ready to go and what it actually still needs to be addressed. So is it not, is we have observable results, but it's not really credible to other people yet, or, you know, there's a lot of other um, options on the market already. So it isn't, isn't unique in it yet. I, I just think that we think about scalability as like adopted by a local context, but we don't think about actually all the parameters that are needed. And so I would just really encourage people to think about doing a scalability assessment. I think the MSI one that we used was great. Um, and I would encourage others to even self-assess after you do something to figure out where you're hitting the mark and where you actually need to boost it a bit if you are going to have a more sustainable long-term project. Um, and so I, and especially with technology. So yeah, I would just encourage projects to do it. Great, thank you. Well, we've hit, we've hit the time. I just wanna say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Thank you to STS and um, Sash, Rama and Ayan for taking an opportunity to share more about your projects. Um, you'll see in the chat that the, this report, um, the summative report and reports on all of our projects are on the allchildrenreading.org website. If you look under research, you can find those there. Please, please use them, download them, look at them, and, and use them as reference. There's a lot of great learnings about, about what works and what doesn't work and as a learning tool um, to help you as you, as you work in, in ed tech as well. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, we'll, we'll be sending out uh, the recorded presentation so you can review them. That I think many of the speakers have also put their their emails and contact information in the chat. So feel free to reach out with them to them directly if you have any questions, and also feel free to reach out to us at all if you have any questions. And we'll be in touch. Um, we hope to have another web ability. So stay tuned for that. And thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.